the live version of The Way South is a lot of fun, both enthralling and inspiring to audiences of all ages. But with everything going on in the world right now, we figured you could use an escape. That's why we've created this online version of The Way South, to bring you some joy, laughter, a little bit of drama, a lot of penguins, but mostly to experience the majesty that is Antarctica. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I'm on the deck of the Ocean Nova. The snow is blowing. The ship is rocking. The wind is howling. And, well, it's cold. Welcome to The Way South, presented by Focus Relief, Photography for Charity. My name is Tarek Trad, and for the next 30 minutes or so, I'll be your host on this journey. So let's get started, shall we? To give you a little background, I joined a select group of 16 photographers on an air, sea, land, and ice expedition of the Antarctic Peninsula. Our expedition was led by BBC Photographer of the Year and Focus Relief Board Member, Robert Salisbury Knight. When you get a chance, please Google his name and his work. Robert is the name in fine art photography. His work is quite stunning. On average, Antarctica is the coldest, driest, windiest, highest and harshest continent on the planet. So it begs the question, why in the heck would anyone want to go there? Especially for a thin-blooded Southern California boy such as myself. Well, there are quite a number of reasons actually. The one that most people think of is ambition. Though personally, I never knew that going to Antarctica was a thing. I thought it was strictly for scientists and researchers. There are also many different why reasons, as listed here, to experience the majesty of this region. For me, however, there was a definite purpose behind the trip. For much of my life, I've been blessed to be surrounded by people that have dedicated their lives to certain community services and grassroots causes. Everything from interfaith efforts to providing free medical services to those less fortunate. As a photographer, I wondered how I could do the same. How could I use my photography, my skill and passion, to benefit humanity, even if it was making a difference to just one person? Then, in 2017, I traveled to Columbia, Missouri to photograph the Great American Solar Eclipse. When I shared this collage photo on social media, my friends suddenly wanted to buy it. Typically, if someone liked my photography, I would just give it away. But about the same time, there were hurricanes ravaging Texas and Florida and Puerto Rico. So I had an idea. 
Let's sell this photo in limited editions, sign and number them, and donate the proceeds to disaster relief. In less than 10 days, we raised enough money for food banks to feed 64 people, three meals a day for an entire month. Now, $2,000 is not a lot of money when it comes to disaster relief. However, if you were one of those 64 people that didn't have to worry about a meal for the next month, this was absolutely making a difference in someone's life. So my wife and I did a little research on food banks and our eyes were opened. It turns out more than one in seven Americans, more than 30 million people on the richest nation on earth are food insecure. That means they don't get enough of the right foods for a healthy, active lifestyle. They rely on food banks to fill in their nutritional gaps. With a real sense of urgency, we started Focus Relief, Photography for Charity. That's focusrelief.com, where we offer a simple vision. Invest in our limited edition gallery quality photography and 100% of our profits will go to food banks working to end hunger in the U.S. Pretty simple, right? So, how in the heck do you get to Antarctica anyway? With all the travel logistics handled by Earth Expeditions, we left Los Angeles and flew to Lima, Peru. From Lima to Santiago, Chile, and from Santiago, we flew to one of the southernmost cities in South America, Punta Arenas where we spent the night and the following day after traveling more than 24 hours just to get there. Once we received clearance, it's just a short two hour flight to Antarctica. Traveling by ship is an option, but then you'd have to cross the Drake Passage, the roughest seas in the world, where it can take anywhere from two to five days. Luckily, our arrangements were to fly to King George Island. From a seasonal perspective, as many of you know, the seasons in the Southern Hemisphere are opposite those of the Northern Hemisphere. So while January is winter in Los Angeles, it's summer in Antarctica. But for giggles, as you can see here, let's imagine we're traveling at the peak of the Antarctic winter in September. Clearly, it can be quite brutal. In addition to the extremely low temperatures on the continent, sea ice, where the sea actually freezes, accounts to more than double the area of Antarctica. Luckily for us, when traveling in January, there's still quite a bit of sea ice surrounding most of the continent, but with the right ship, you can access the Antarctic Peninsula. The Antarctic Circle is important to note, as on the longest day of the year, December 21st, the sun does not set. It remains daylight 24 hours a day. We arrived two weeks after this, yet still experienced 22 and 23 hour days. So, upon given clearance by regional authorities, we boarded the short takeoff and landing jet and arrived at the Chilean Naval Air Base of Frey Station on King George Island. Where upon exiting the plane, we walked single file for a mile or so to the shore. Once at the shore, we were met with these rubberized boats called Zodiacs. Remember this name as we utilized Zodiacs quite a bit during our expedition. From there, the Zodiacs took us to our home and base station for the next week or so, the Ocean Nova. Now I know what you're thinking. Tarek, you are on a cruise ship with Broadway shows, 24-hour buffets, the life of luxury. The reality was that the Ocean Nova was a working ship. There was no entertainment except ourselves and the crew. And if you missed a meal, well, you better know someone that worked in the kitchen. Otherwise, you'd be out of luck until the next mealtime. To give you a sense of scale, imagine this. This ship is the Symphony of the Seas, the largest cruise ship in the world at the time. It's 18 decks high, 1,200 feet long, and holds up to 9,000 passengers and crew. It is literally a floating city. 
By comparison, this little toy boat in the water next to the Symphony of the Seas is the Ocean Nova. It's four decks high, 239 feet long, and holds up to 70 passengers and crew. While I am sure you would seem to feel safer on the larger ship, the Ocean Nova is ice strengthened, which allowed it to sail through brash ice. Also being smaller, it can go into shallower waters closer to the shore than the larger ships can. The one disadvantage of the size of the Ocean Nova is that you would feel every bump and every wave in the water. I thought it was important to give you a little setup, some background before we jumped into the frigid, ice-filled waters of the Antarctic. Before we can get to the continent, however, we first have to cross the Bransfield Strait. And believe me, it's slow going. It took us nearly 18 hours to journey 100 miles by ship. It is open seas too, which means the waters can get quite rough. Our first real sighting was B-46. No, that's not a vitamin. It's an iceberg, but not just any iceberg. Let me outline it for you. B-46 calved off the Pine Island Glacier about 800 miles south of us just a few months earlier. What you're seeing is a photo that was taken with a 400 millimeter lens, which is about 10 times what the human eye can see. It was large. How large? Well, it stretched across our horizon, estimated to be three times the size of Manhattan. As I mentioned, my purpose was not one from an environmental perspective, but we were informed that such an event used to occur every six or seven years. Now, according to researchers on the ship, we are now seeing such events yearly. As a lot of us were newbies to Antarctica, we did not know what to expect. Well, we had an idea, but we didn't expect to have such a frenetic experience. It was a combination of sitting back and resting, while also being on full tilt alert and ready with our camera gear so we wouldn't miss a once in a lifetime photo opportunity. Yes, frenetic. Case in point, Take this somewhat large iceberg. It was the first of its kind we saw. Okay, extremely large. Large enough to land a small plane on it. Again, being newbies, we were not sure when or if we'd see anything like this again. So, I personally took at least 1,000 photos of this one iceberg. Newbies. It wasn't long after this that drama mean and the rocking of the ship sent me to bed, around midnight, the earliest I would get to sleep for the rest of our expedition. For the next morning, from my perspective at least, our expedition was about to start as we arrived at Portal Point, where we would actually set foot on the continent of Antarctica. This photo might seem quite normal to you, or you might see two things that seem out of place. One, the sun is shining brightly, and two, I'm not wearing any gloves. This turned out to be the only sunny and relatively warm day of our expedition. It was 38 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind was not blowing. In Antarctica, the wind is always the key. After exploring Portal Point on snowshoes for a couple of hours, we got back on board our Zodiac, for a private photographer's tour of the inlet. Going places and seeing things most never have.
From the sublime to the ridiculous that is Antarctica, we're about to head over to Culverville Island, home of the largest colony of Gentoo penguins in the region, with more than 5,000 mating pairs. A couple of things I'm always asked. Tarek, did you see any penguins? How close could you get to them? And what do penguins taste like? <laughs> Just kidding, baby harp seals. But seriously though, since penguins are a protected species on Antarctica, they were not on the menu. We were allowed to get within 5 meters or 15 feet of them, but if we just stopped or sat on the ice, it's okay if these curious creatures came right up next to you. In this first photo, taken by my friend Linda, you can see this is about the expected distance between us. However, later that morning, while I was taking pictures of penguins jumping in and out of the water, a friend said I needed to turn around. When I looked up, I saw I was blocking the path of this little guy, just trying to get past me to the water. I was so close that I literally had to step back a few feet so he would fit in the picture. So cute! As we discovered, the penguin colonies are typically high up on the hillside. This not only protects them from predators, it gives them the most amazing views. Well, at least I appreciated their views. It's also amazing that, as a community, they all work together for the safety and security of the whole. Both males and females are responsible for taking care of the eggs and hatchlings while also going out into the water for food. You can see from this photo that they would regularly fend off airborne predators such as the Antarctic skua with a loud honking noise. And if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll capture an amazing sight like this. On our way to our next destination, we needed to traverse through some of the most ice-choked waters we've seen. Along with the sea ice was something I can only describe as an iceberg graveyard. These gigantic bergs broke off from either glaciers or the ice shelf and are the size of very large buildings and even football stadiums, some as high as 300 feet or more both beautiful and horrifying at the same time. We are now about to cross the Antarctic Circle. We mentioned earlier about how on the summer solstice, the sun shines in this zone 24 hours a day. In the winter, it's the opposite. The sun doesn't rise at all. The closer you get to the Antarctic Circle, the more sea ice you'll find in the water. Not believing what I was seeing, I took this video on the deck of the Ocean Nova with my iPhone. This is the actual speed. Even with the ice cover, you can still see the undulations of the sea, up and down, making it a matter of when, not if, we'd be hitting these frozen blocks in the water. Thankfully, we were on an ice-strengthened ship. And now we're about to make a sea ice landing. If that sounds kind of sketchy to you, well, it certainly did to me. While we knew there were inherent risks in going to Antarctica, we also knew our crew and expedition leaders put our safety first. As you can see from this picture, they found a safe way to get the Zodiacs close enough to get us ashore. Since I was there on behalf of Focus Relief, I thought this would be a good place to make a little infomercial. You know, tell our subscribers on social media where we were and what we were doing that day. Take a look 
let me know what you think. Hi, this is Tarek Trad with Focus Relief. You said you wanted more photos. Well, we've not only gone to the end of the earth for you, we're also walking on water. Well, not technically, but today we're in Antarctica and we're standing on the ice shelf, which is basically three meters of ice that builds out above the ocean and spreads out. Eventually it becomes icebergs. Sounds good, right? <laughs> I don't think so. I thought I had it all going. But if you notice, I turned my head slightly to the left because our polar naturalist, Nigel, was shaking his head. So when I asked him what was wrong, he told me everything I got wrong. And it was a lot. So instead of doing another take, I thought it would be better to hear directly from my English friend. Cue Nigel. Where we are right now is south of the Antarctic Circle in a place called Crystal Sound standing on the frozen ocean. This is water. It freezes up in the winter. It may break out every summer. This has probably been here more than one year. It will break out into the sort of brash ice we were sailing through on the ship earlier. But this is walking on water. This is as near as you can get to walking on, on water. There's a good layer of snow on the top. It's been here a while. There's probably 50 centimeters of snow on top of that ice. Really, really solid ice. The ice edge over that way, about half a kilometer from us. See, isn't exactly what I said? Thank you, Nigel. One of the most common questions that everyone wants to know about Antarctica is how cold does it get? Well, summer in Antarctica is about the same as winter in the northeast of the U.S., with temperatures in the teens and 20s, unless the winds are blowing. Then all bets are off. It can get ferociously cold. However, no one ever asks, how cold was the water? Well, I know exactly how cold it was. And it wasn't until that moment that I realized just how badly I was losing my hair. And for the record, the water temperature in Crystal Sound was 29 degrees. Brr. This portion of the show is titled, From the Sublime to the Ridiculous, and for good reason. This is the part of the show where anything can happen. So I'll wait here until you get your popcorn. Three... Two, one. Got it? Good. All right, I'm going to show you two photos taken a very short time apart of the same mountain on Adelaide Island, inside the Antarctic Circle. Trust me when I tell you, this is the same island, the one on the bottom taken just moments after the first. The first image was taken just before dinner, around 6.36 p.m. local time according to the date stamp on my digital file. A pretty spectacular view, with open ocean between us and the island. The captain anchored the ship so we can enjoy dinner at 7 p.m. In the middle of our meal, less than 40 minutes after the previous shot, the winds and currents suddenly changed, and sea ice filled the spaces where open waters once appeared. While we had seen some ice-choked waters earlier on our expedition, nothing could compare to what we were now experiencing. Just like that, the Ocean Nova had no place to go. Completely surrounded by sea ice that was pushing tighter and closer together. I would be lying if I didn't say I wasn't a bit nervous. And if you've ever read the book Endurance, we felt just like Shackleton's crew. And as you can tell by now, I have a sense of humor. I like to tell jokes. But if you throw in a little tension, anxiety, nervousness, well, let's see what kind of trouble I can get into. Occasionally there was Wi-Fi on the ship, and it was in those moments I would send a group text to my family to keep them updated on our experiences. I think you can guess where this is headed. For some reason, I thought it would be funny if I sent this photo and tell my wife and sons, 
Bad news, we're currently stuck in the ice. Good news, this is our view. It wasn't until I saw my wife's reply, when I remembered I was 7,500 miles from home, and how such information might not go over so well. She wrote in calm letters, Is this typical? Is this typical? She wants to know if this is typical. All I knew was that I was an idiot about to get in a lot of trouble on the home front. How in the heck would I know if this is typical? But before I can get too worked up, I received a separate text from my son Omar. It read like this. Dad, can you not throw bad news in the family group chat? Mom freaks out. It's just super dramatic. If you really are in deep trouble, please come to us first. Because Mom freaks out when you say things like, I'm stuck in the ice, bad news. Please love you. Well, Omar, bravo. Message received loud and clear. So I responded to Omar the only way I could. I fell on the sword and told him, Roger that, sorry. As for the question from my wife that was still hanging in the air, is this typical? I also responded to her the only way I could. This is very normal. And to be honest, a few hours later, around 7 a.m., things were back to normal. The ship was moving again. The captain figured out that the ice surrounding us must have come from somewhere that no longer had ice, so he used all the available technology at his fingertips. Sonar, radar, satellite imagery. He turned the ship around and got us back into open waters. Later that night at dinner, the captain gave us the quote of the year. We were never stuck in the ice. We simply made very, very slow progress for 12 hours. Well, thank you, Captain Herrera and crew for keeping us safe. I'm not sure any of us want to know what would have happened had we not escaped from such a dilemma. Our next stop is Paradise Bay. I'm not sure who named this place, but they certainly got it right. The beauty here has a majestic quality and calmness to it. I tried my best to capture it in photos, but I'm not sure they do it justice. I hope you enjoy them. As we returned to the Ocean Nova, an orca, a killer whale, surfaced just between our zodiac and the ship. Quite a thrilling moment. The morning we headed over to Orne Harbor, the long days of 22 hours of daylight, the lack of restful sleep, our constant state of frenetic anxiety, finally caught up to many of us. I woke up not feeling well at all. My throat was very sore. My head was pounding. I felt a bit achy in my joints with a tinge of fever. Not good. As we headed outside, things did not get any better. It was cold out. Very cold. The snow was blowing. The wind was howling. The fog was rolling in. And between us and the top of Warren Harbor was a very steep wall of ice. As we progressed, the conditions, both physically for me and weather-wise for the location, 
worsened. Fully dressed in heavy winter gear from head to toe, hiking up a steep ice-covered hill with 30 pounds of camera gear on my back, I was starting to sweat, heavily, and cough, and ache. When we reached the top near the colony of chinstrap penguins, more than a thousand meters from where we started, we were getting close to whiteout conditions. At the top, it was startling to see the penguins acting like this was nothing, because to them it wasn't. This was their summer, and they still needed to get up and down the hill to find food and to make sure their eggs and hatchlings and each other were protected from predators and the elements. It was completely fascinating to be in such a place. To top it off, here in the wilds of Antarctica, when we thought we saw it all, we saw a chick hatch right in front of us. An extremely touching moment. By then, I had had enough. I was overwhelmed in every way imaginable. Physically, mentally, emotionally and descended down the ice in the wind and the snow and the fog. When I finally arrived at the bottom, I asked our Zodiac driver, Wendy, to take me home. And not home to the ship, mind you, but back to Los Angeles. I was cold, sick, tired, already took thousands of photos, a lens for my glasses popped out, and I was ready for my own bed, my own shower, my own house. I had had enough. And as a smart Zodiac driver like Wendy was, she did the only thing that anyone in her position could or should do, and that is to take us on a slow, deliberate tour of Orne Harbor before heading back to the ship. At the very moment I was feeling my lowest, we turned the corner in the Zodiac to come across this lone, stoic, Gen 2 penguin standing on the rocks in the blowing snow. It only took a moment for our eyes to lock, and like some Vulcan mind meld, I suddenly understood, as if the penguin was saying to me, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You got this. Immediately, my disposition changed. I stopped feeling sorry for myself and learned that things could be a lot worse. And for good measure, I took his profile portrait, probably my favorite photographic moment of the expedition. When we got back to the ship, I took a hot shower and felt a lot better. As we left the harbor, we spotted the humpback whale and her baby, teaching her baby how to feed on krill. At first I thought they were too far away to get a decent shot, but then they came closer and closer and closer until bang, they were right on the ship, within a few feet, right there. And she opened her mouth and let in a gigantic load of krill. Then, the pair said their goodbyes and swam off into the sunset. Well, if there was a sunset. As we left the harbor, the local penguins had one last show for us, leaping out of the water as only penguins can. A touching send-off. Simply magical. Whaler's Bay on Deception Island is an active caldera of a volcano. In addition to being the largest colony of chinstrap penguins on the peninsula, it's also quite the sight to see. Glaciers and frigid water rimmed by steam venting through the volcanic rocks along the shoreline. Just another example of the otherworldliness that is Antarctica. I was casually following this pair of penguins along the coastline when I started to notice what appeared to be odd behavior. And that's when I decided to start shooting this video. As you can see, as they walked or waddled, every now and again, they would head toward the water, appear to be ready to dive in, then suddenly, nope, and change their mind, only to head up the coast and do the same exact thing 
a short while later. What was it? Was the water too cold, too hot, or was something just not right? Turns out it was not right at all, as this leopard seal, an apex predator in the region and major threat to penguins, was patrolling the waters for its next meal. From the looks of those teeth, I would not want to venture too far either. It was an amazing expedition, full of the sublime and ridiculous nature of Antarctica. But like all things, it must come to an end. As we approached King George Island on the Ocean Nova, our dark and cloudy day changed, the heavens opened up, the sun appeared, and shared this glorious view to end our expedition. From all of us at Focus Relief, when you invest in art and humanity, everyone wins. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this journey. It was a pleasure to take you along with us. To learn more about what we're doing at Focus Relief, or if you'd like us to present a live version of The Way South at no cost for your school, business, community center, house of worship, or private home, contact us at focusrelief.com and sign up for our newsletter. Take care, stay safe, and be kind to one another.